Hey guys, welcome to Cakewalk Cambridge. I'm Aisha and today we're going to start with chapter 3, Movement in and out of cells. This is a very easy chapter and holds quite a lot of weightage in your papers because it is interconnected to every topic almost in bio. So just make sure that you're thorough with this and you'll be good. Let's get started. Okay. So movement in and out of cells. Firstly, you need to know there are three ways that substances move in and out of cells. One is diffusion, osmosis, and active transport. Okay, so there are just three main concepts in this chapter, and you will learn each of them in detail. So diffusion, so the first line here is the definition of diffusion. Um, it is the net movement of molecules and ions from a region of that higher concentration to a region of the lower concentration as a result of their random movement. So I've highlighted again the parts of the definition that give you marks. So net movement of molecules and ions is one mark. Then you can either say from a higher concentration to lower concentration as one mark or down a concentration gradient because they mean the same. And as a result of their random motion is your third mark. So what exactly is diffusion? So if you have a test tube with um, ammonia gas um, um, sprayed in from one side, the, mo the molecules will move towards the region where there is no gas, to towards the other side. And that is because it is diffusing from its higher concentration where it is being sprayed, where there are many molecules, to its lower concentration when there are, where there are no molecules virtually. And that is what is called diffusion. And this process occurs as a result of their random movement, the molecules' random movement. So the energy for diffusion here comes from the kinetic energy of the random movement of molecules. You should be able to state this second point. It's given in your syllabus or something, something that a candidate who's studying IGCSE should be able to state. And um, here, substance moves, substances move into and out of cells by diffusion through the cell membrane. In the previous chapter, we looked at the structures of the cell. So if you remember, the cell membrane is a thin um, lining of cytoplasm around the cell. That's the cell's boundary. And substances move into and out of the cell through this membrane. Okay, so diffusion occurs in liquids and in gases. It doesn't occur in solids because there are no spaces between molecules due to strong forces of attraction, which you should know by now. So these are some of, so the first like, Three examples are important examples of diffusion. That is oxygen and carbon dioxide diffusing during respiration at the alveoli for gas exchange. Um, you will learn this in chapters 11 and 12. It's quite interesting and really simple. You just need to know the fundamentals of diffusion. That is down a concentration gradient. So one is for respiration. The second is oxygen and carbon dioxide diffusing into and out of a leaf through the stomata. For photosynthesis, which is the process by which plants manufacture carbohydrates, you should know this as well by now. And the third most important example is auxin, which is a growth hormone produced in plant um, shoots that diffuses um, through the stem in response to light and gravity in a plant. This is an important concept which you will be learning in chapter 14, but it's always good to remember it now and make note of it. So later on chapter 14, when you look at the word auxin, it's not a new term. You've already exposed yourself to it initially. Then you've got basic examples like after you dissolve sugar in um, tea, the sugar spreads out, the molecules of sugar spread out throughout the tea, through the liquid, and that is diffusing. And then um, perfume molecules diffusing through the air or um, cooked food. When you cook food, um, the whole house um, has the aroma of the food, and that is because the molecules in the air diffuse through the house from a region of that higher concentration that is near the food to lower concentrations that is all around the house that is far away from the food okay now these are the four main factors that diffusion depends on um it it make it explains itself pretty much but here's just a one line explanation so first you have surface area um so to create the surface area the faster the diffusion so, for example, um, if you have a small um, rectangle with a, with a surface area of 1 cm square, and if you have another rectangle with a surface area of 10 cm square, and you're passing the same volume of gas through it, if it's supposing like a cell membrane kind of material with pores, 
then obviously it diffusion is going to happen faster where the area is two centimeters because there's a greater area so more particles will pass through per unit time um then the second um, factor is concentration gradient so i told you the concentration gradient is how um, concentrated the substance is in one area versus how concentrated it is in another area so if um, there is a high concentration of ammonia gas that is being sprayed through the test tube on one side the concentration gradient is steeper because it's a higher concentration of ammonia gas to no ammonia gas however if you use a lower concentration of the same ammonia gas it's going to be slow because there are fewer particles per unit that are diffusing um, so steeper the concentration gradient faster the rate of diffusion this is also important when it comes to ventilation and um, gas exchange in the alveoli oxygen has to continually be removed from the alveoli and taken in by red blood cells so that there's no oxygen in the alveoli so more diffuses in again that's how the concentration gradient is maintained then you have temperature which is quite easy so higher the temperature higher the kinetic energy of molecules molecules move faster and therefore molecules diffuse faster which is basically the movement of molecules itself and then you have the distance so a smaller distance means molecules will have to travel less so more molecules be, will be able to diffuse in the same amount of time so diffusion is faster if you have an alveoli that is one centimeter thick versus one that is two centimeters thick it's obviously going to take more time to diffuse to an alveoli that's two centimeters thick because it has to penetrate a greater distance so that is why smaller the distance faster the diffusion rate just remember the correlations and um, you will be fine then we have osmosis that was the first part now we're already on the second part we're on the second part of three parts of this chapter so osmosis is basically about water molecules only you would never use it for other particles ions anything osmosis is directly and only related to water molecules so it is the net movement of water molecules make sure you write water very central otherwise you won't get your marks from a region of a higher water potential to a region of lower water potential through a partially permeable membrane so what is important is that um, you write water molecules that's your first mark now I'm going to explain water potential. Water potential is basically the likelihood of a substance gaining or losing water. So when you have a high water potential, it means it's dilute. The substance has a lot of water, greater proportion of water to other molecules present in the solution. And um, low water potential means it's concentrated. So for example, if I have um, 10 centimeter cube of water and one gram of sugar, versus 10 centimeter cube of water and 5 grams of sugar the first solution is going to have a higher water potential because it has a greater ratio of water is to the substance so again you can either write high water potential to low water potential or you write down the water potential gradient you get your same mark if you don't want to be too wordy you write down the water potential gradient but if you want to write it like properly with like a full explanation then you can write it the first way that's no problem and through a partially permeable membrane, it's quite important. Um, you get your third mark for this answer. And very often they ask you how, um, okay, we'll get to this in the next slide. Okay, I'll get to that. Anyways, so water diffuses through the partial, partially permeable membrane by osmosis. So very in an MCQ, they once asked what is, um, is diffusion involved in osmosis? Yes, it is because water virtually diffuses through the partially permeable membrane from its high water potential to its low water potential yeah that was basically it okay so there are basically three types of solutions you have an isotonic solution a hypotonic solution and a hypotonic solution you are not required to know these terms at all i've not seen it in any textbook except isotonic which was there for my syllabus especially um, but I'm explaining all three to you just in case and so it's easy for you to understand if you have to do a test for an, like an entry exam or something where you may probably need to know it but I'll just explain it to you. Um, so an isotonic solution is one that has the same uh, concentration of the solution outside the cell and inside the cell. So energy drinks virtually are isotonic so that um, no water is lost from the cell via osmosis. 
Then you have hypotonic solution, which is basically a dilute solution. It has a higher water potential than what is maintained by cells, so more water. And a hypotonic solution is the opposite. A hypotonic solution has a low water potential and a greater ratio of substances, substances and ions to water in the solution. So it basically has a low water potential than your normal cells. So basically, if you put a red blood cell in an isotonic, you know, right, a red blood cell basically transports oxyhemoglobin. So if you put a normal red blood cell into an isotonic solution, the, there's no concentration gradient at all. There's no water potential gradient because the water potential inside the cell and outside the cell is the same. So the shape of the cell is restored. If you put a red blood cell in a hypotonic solution, which means it has a greater water potential. So water is going to, there is a water potential gradient maintained in the hypotonic solution and in the red blood cell. So water will move from the hypotonic solution to the red blood cell down the water potential gradient to reach an equilibrium. Now the problem is animal cells don't have cell walls. Now because of this, as soon as water is absorbed by the cell and it exceeds the water carrying capacity, the cell will swell and then burst because there is no other external boundary like a cell wall to prevent the pressure from burst, keep, from keeping it, um, prevent the pressure from tearing it apart. So when you put a red blood cell in a hypotonic solution, um, your red blood cells burst because there's too much water because water moves into the red blood cell via osmosis through the partially be through the partially be sorry through the partially permeable cell membrane. Okay. Then the third, you have red blood cells in a hypotonic solution. Here, the red blood cells have a greater water potential, and the ice and the hypotonic solution has a low water potential because it has more molecules inside it. So water will move from the red blood cell to the isotope to the hypotonic solution to maintain an equilibrium so water will be lost from the red blood cell virtually because water moves via osmosis through the partially permeable membrane into the solution down the water potential gradient that's your definition so these this is how a red blood cell looks when it's shriveled now the correct word for writing shriveled is crenated its shape is crenated um, I've not really seen it um, in many past papers. It's not a requirement, but if you write it, it's always good because the examiner knows that you know your stuff. So this is when it becomes crenated and, that, and there's a process called plasmolysis where water leaves a cell and makes it flaccid. Okay, flaccid is when um, it lacks water and it's limp, if you know what I mean. So that is red blood cells. Now we're going to plant cells. If you put a plant cell in an isotonic solution, there's no water potential gradient, so its shape is restored. If you put it in a hypotonic solution, the same thing will happen as red blood cells, but it will not burst. It will stay turgid. Turgid. Now, turgid pressure is basically when water enters a cell and the cell wall resists the force, the force of the water, the pressure exerted by the water on the cell. And so the cell won't burst, it'll just become extremely firm. So this is called turgid pressure and this firmness of the cell is when it's turgid. So that is what your plant cell becomes. And mind you, it's turgid because it has a cell wall to resist the external pressure from the water. Then you have um, a plant cell in a hypotonic solution. And this time, again, water will leave the plant cell down a water potential gradient. And when water leaves the plant cell, it becomes limp, it becomes flaccid. The firmness is lost. The whole structure of the cell is just lost. So what happens is water leaves the cell and the cell membrane tears itself from the cell wall and it starts shrinking and shriveling up. This is again an example of plasmolysis, okay, where the cell becomes flaccid. So you use um, flaccid for plant cells. It's very important to use this term, flaccid where it becomes like it loses its firmness it becomes weak like if you're holding it it's just weak like take an example of a water balloon if you fill a water balloon to its full capacity it's firm you can't really crush it but if you have a if you have if you have a water balloon and you fill it to half its capacity there's still room to compress it a little it's still a little flexible and this is what you mean by flaccid this is very important to study this diagram. Okay, 
and this is all about turgor pressure so plants are supported by the pressure of water inside the cells pressing outwards on the cell wall that you i already explained to you there's water inside the cells that keeps it firm because it take it uses up the remaining space and keeps it firm by exerting a force on the cell wall okay now this is how plants absorb water plants absorb water via osmosis so water from the soil moves into the root hair cells via osmosis down a water potential gradient so there is more water in the soil than there is in the plant so the soil has a higher water potential than the plant so to maintain an equilibrium water moves in via osmosis from a higher water potential the soil to a low water potential the roots down a water potential gradient through the partially permeable membrane of the root hair cell now when they ask you this kind of question what you should know is that um you get one mark for even mentioning which area has the higher water potential gradient and low water potential so for example if the question is how do root hair cells absorb water you get one mark for osmosis one mark for mentioning high to low water potential gradient one mark for through a partially permeable membrane which is a cell membrane and one mark is for mentioning that the soil has a higher water potential and the other mark is for mentioning that the roots have a low water potential you get five marks just like this so mention every detail that you know okay so when plants transpire they lose water in the form of vapor so that's how the plants usually have a low water potential than the soil because they lose the water um this is basically what i explained to you turgor pressure water entering a cell causes the vacuole and cytoplasm to swell up which push, puts an outward pressure on the cell wall which resists the force and this makes the plant cell firm and this is called turgor pressure you should be able to explain this it's quite easy and that's your last segment active transport again active transport is basically just the opposite of diffusion it is the movement of particles through a cell membrane another mark from a region of lower concentration to higher concentration against a concentration gradient using energy from respiration one mark for energy from respiration one mark for against the concentration gradient one mark for cell membrane one mark one mark for movement of particles so make sure you mention all four of these and water is not involved in active transport so do not mention water molecules water molecules is only osmosis Okay, so now examples. Ions are taken up by root hair cells via active transport. Why? Because simply the soil has a lower um, concentration. The soil has a lower concentration of ions, while the plants have a greater concentration. Again, then you have the uptake of glucose by epithelial cells in the villi, which is basically in the small intestine. You will learn that later. And then you have the uptake of glucose by kidney tubules, which is again you will learn in chapter thirteen. But just know these three examples for now. carrier proteins okay one more thing i just have to mention mitochondria is always um i explained what mitochondria was in the previous chapter it is basically a slipper shaped organelle that um, respires aerobically to provide energy in the form of atp for metabolism mitochondria is present in places of active transport because active transport is where you require energy from respiration so mitochondria plays an important role in that you can always mention it in your answer to get a mark okay next carrier proteins so particles are moved across the membrane during active transport by proteins called carrier proteins so these carrier proteins are embedded in the cell membrane so an ion attaches itself to the carrier protein the carrier protein uses energy from respiration to open up and release the ion into the cell membrane into the cell from the cell membrane that's all you need to know even if you even if you refer to carrier proteins in your answer you get a mark that way igcse is lenient in that terms but you should be able to explain this process as well the diagram is self explanatory okay now these are just some extras that i've seen in papers um the first time i read my textbook for this chapter i wasn't really attentive so i never went through the experiments so if you are like me then this may probably help you a little So proteins don't pass through cell membranes as they are too big for the pores. Only when they are digested to amino acids is when they pass through cell membranes and diffuse. Again, starch can't diffuse outside a dialysis tubing as its molecules are too big. 
but sugars, which is basically the digested form of starch, can go through a dialysis tube. So we're going to use this same knowledge now in the next slide. Okay, this is something I've taken up from a paper. I just took a screenshot of it. So if you have a test tube, we have one test tube here, okay, with distilled water outside the dialysis bag. So basically a dialysis bag is tubing that has pores that are similar to cell membranes. So it can be used to investigate diffusion, osmosis, and active transport. So just know this for now. So you have your dialysis tubing bag. Inside the dialysis tubing bag, you have amylase and starch suspension, and outside you have water. Now, what is amylase? Amylase is an enzyme that digests starch to sugars, basically glucose. And in this bag, you only have water and starch. Now, water obviously has no effect of star on starch because only amylase or an acid can digest the starch. So now later, if we are if we are going to test for um, glucose in this tube, you will find glucose because the, the amylase will digest the starch to glucose. And if you test outside the tube, you will also get a positive test result for glucose. Why? Because glucose molecules are small and so they can pass through the membrane of the dialysis tubing. So both inside the bag and outside the bag, you will get a positive test result for glucose. Now in this um, example, if you test inside the bag or outside the bag for glucose, it's going to be negative because there is no enzyme or substance that can digest the starch. It's only water, so no effect. So there's no sugar. So let's look at this another way. Let's try and test for starch. If you test the bag for starch, you will obviously get a positive test because the starch has not been digested. Now, if you test outside the bag, you will get a negative test because, as I said earlier, starch molecules are too big and won't diffuse through the membrane of the dialysis tubing. And that is why you get a negative test for starch outside. Okay, so that was it. I hope this video helped you guys. Please like it, share it, subscribe. And if you have any questions, comment below or email me. I'm always there to help you guys. I hope this helped you. And we're going to get through this together. So don't worry. Bye.